Hey everybody, welcome back to the program. I am very, very excited because I have a special guest here in the vinyl pad. This is Pat Todd, and he is a singer, songwriter extraordinaire. Thank you so much for being on the program. Thank you, Eric. So I first came in contact with your music through the Lazy Cowgirls. Right. And it's a short story, but I answered this Craigslist ad for a bunch of records for sale, and the guy had a eclectic mix of records here in LA from goth to metal to punk to electronic music and these two records were in that bunch and I was like the lazy cowgirls that's a fantastic name I have to find out more about these guys and that's when I went down the Pat Todd rabbit hole and then this showed up this new record showed up pretty much within the year of discovering the lazy cowgirls I was like wait a minute that's that's the same guy this guy is he's just never stopped you never stopped <laughs> putting out music i mean it's it's pretty incredible this is your fifth record with the rank outside with the, with that yeah, title yeah. but the lazy cowgirls how many records did you guys uh, albums how many albums did you end up putting out god i don't know uh well just to put in perspective um you well the the lazy cowgirls are active from about 82 yeah about 80 82 to 2004 all through 2004 yes and that that is a that's a huge chunk of time i mean yeah. that that is that's a that's a childhood and a, and a yeah, half there it really is you know you when you're doing it like you do anything in life you just live and you don't think of it so it's not every day you think about how long how long have i been alive you know uh but absolutely yeah, it, was a, it was a long time so you obviously you've in that time period you've you've put out these records you've toured you've worked day jobs to to, to supplement income in that time and in, including today like what has been like say some of the biggest changes changes you've seen say in the music industry as a whole in the the way gigs are run in terms of booking gigs like how much has say the internet changed things things change and they don't change at all right when we first came here uh, i told you the little story we came we moved here it was going to move new york or los angeles and the warm weather won out because we were sick yeah. of the midwestern i don't cold. blame you <laughs> so we came here and uh, when we came here it was just to make maybe to play in clubs original m m original music because you couldn't do that at when where we came from, and you had uh, to be a jukebox band. Yeah, you had to be cover band playing the greatest hits of the. And this this was like Indiana. Yes, kind of. I wouldn't say in the middle of nowhere, but right on, almost on the state line. It I is on the state line of yeah. Illinois. It's Vincennes, Indiana, small town, twenty thousand people. Uh, a good place to grow up as a kid for me. Yeah. After that, I started wanting the bigger world. Yeah. Uh, as you do. Also, when we decided to leave, and when we did leave. Uh, there was no underground circuit yet that, that we knew of, at least. We may have been babes in the woods to a point. I don't know the answer. Yeah. But we didn't know that there were these other things bubbling up all over, and you didn't hear so much about it like that. Yeah. It was either New York or Los Angeles were the main places to go for music and where the main things seemed to be happening. Plus where the main labels were. Yeah, and we just thought, well, let's do that. Yeah. And I thought, well, maybe we'll get lucky and make a record out there, and maybe we'll play to some people who want to hear original material. We were never thinking that we were going to get signed to a major label because we just weren't, you know, the commercial type of yeah. music. So uh, it was never our dream to make it, unquote. And then lo and behold, you know, we did a million records and still are and toured all over the world, all over Europe, Canada, America, Japan. So far exceeded my small expectations. Yeah, I think you pursue what you love. And to me, that's so much more important than money. It's great to have money. It's a great tool, as we all know. Yeah. But it was never my driving force. It still isn't. And you'd love to make a million dollars and you'd love to have a yeah. billion fans. But it was never what made me do it or would stop me from doing it. And I know so many people, you talk, you hit on a thing that, kills everyone in the world they did they let disappointment ruin yeah poison their heart and yeah. they no longer love what they love to do and they can't see past this ideal of uh reward of money i like money 
I like money, but not to the ex extent that I will do anything or become something that I'm not or whatever. And that's no highfalutin idea. It's not like I'm some damn saint. I don't mean that. That's I'm as I have feet of clay, just like the rest of the world. But I mean, that was always my driving force, and that's what keeps me doing it. And I don't really care about what people think. You'd love for people to like you. I'm not going to say that I don't. Exactly. You, you're making music. You're recording performing because you you love to do it and it feeds who you are on the inside yes and the fact that and the rest be damned in a way <laughs> and the fact that you've been able to do it and continue to find joy in it i mean that that is so inspiring i think i will well thanks i mean i'm not the first and yeah, uh but you know but but a thank you for even thinking that or noticing that so what was uh what was it like uh, you know, these L.A. clubs, because nowadays I've heard there's a lot of pay to play. Like you got to hustle to get people to show up. You still do. You, st you still do. But anyway. was it like that back then? though? It was then. We came out here thinking that, you know, we'd seen the pictures and read these yeah. things. And yeah. we thought, well, you come out here and you play in these clubs and people go. Right. But, of course, we had a rude awakening that you're going to be playing on Tuesdays and Wednesdays and Thursdays when you first start. And nobody knows who you are and nobody cares so there's nobody at the clubs when you play mm, yeah. and uh, it took a long time to even get that going to where people would start where we had five ten twenty people how did the name come about anyway uh, the lazy cowgirls uh i was working in a warehouse at the time and they had the radio on and i heard neil young song cowgirl in the sand which i like i might add yeah and i and i said the cowgirls and i said but it's got to be a kind of cowgirls the Lazy Cowgirls. I literally said it out loud. And as soon as I yeah. said it, that's it. I knew it. Yeah. I'm not a big fan of uh, bat, fake badassery like most sure. rock and roll bands have. Yeah, they're putting, yeah, I get you. Where they couldn't fight their way out of a paper bag. <laughs> and what, why do you want to, for that matter? But, I mean, it's just that whole yeah. fake macho. And I, I wanted to stay away from that. And I wanted to stay away from the... Uh, the uh, all the punk bands at the time here with their angry names because you know then you talk to them and they were nice people and they had jobs and yeah. now they're probably all selling insurance <laughs> and you know you'd see them and they pet a dog so you know they would, yeah you know, you know some of that i thought was just like that's not really true so i love the new york dolls and uh, i love the rolling stones and neither one of those bands are what you would call really macho and i like the yeah. idea hey that's a little yeah. bit of a fem yeah. Female touch there. Yeah. Got. So that's kind of how, that's exactly how it came down. And and that's something I wanted to talk about too. Uh, Rank Outsiders is is a recurring a recurring motif, a name. Like I've noticed a, a later Lazy Cowgirls took that as an album title. Album title, yeah. Uh, your your own record label, I believe. or Rank Outsider Records, and, yeah. Um, and I wonder if you could tell me or touch on what that, phrase what that word means to you well you know it came down in the same way that cowgirls come down in a way because i was looking for a name for the band or or, or for that album actually yeah and you, i've always heard the rolling stone song uh tumbling dice and it says i'm a rank outsider yeah, in there and of course yeah, that's an old yeah. term from a million years ago yeah and that was always for someone in a, a fight or a race Right, you know, a, a horse, race, horse race, horse races, or boxing, or anything yeah. else, anything. Who someone was counted on, who was an underdog, yeah, who was at the at best at the margins. And I always thought, well, that's pretty much who and what we are, whether we wish it to be or not. And I thought that was the title for that album. And I always thought that's a great. I thought that would have been a great name for the band, the Rank Outsiders. That's. I mean, I I, I love that that you've sort of adopted that name, almost as a badge of honor. Because it really represents you, your whole your through line, like from when you landed here. It's very poetic, I yeah. have to say. And it, it it's, well, thank you, thank it, you for noticing. <laughs> I appreciate that. And it's very clear that you are a wordsmith, a songwriter. You, it was very much chosen with intention. I yeah, think that's. I think that's great. I think. I mean, I, I'm guilty of uh, choosing with intention. I think that's, <laughs> no, I think that, that's great. <laughs> I'm a big Bob Dylan fan too. And I realized, boy, if I ever wrote songs, I'd like to write songs that were 
came from me because like a person like that or Ray Davies or somebody from the Kinks, those songs came from them and all the blues and rock and roll and great early country. When you hear those records, it's like they're talking to you. You know, whether it's a funny story, a sad story, yeah. a celebration, whatever. And that's what I love about rock and roll, punk, blues, country, and folk. Uh, I don't, You know what I'm saying? They speak to you, and you can put yourself right there with them. In other words, you can create with them. And I just thought, man, if I could be a link in that chain, mm-hmm. that would be a tremendous thing to be in your life. Call you on Sunday night. Yeah, you had a bad night. I mean, yeah. one, that's a great title. Oh, thanks. But two, I, that's m- might be my favorite song. No, that's not my favorite song. Uh, the, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. So on there, we got some great harmonica. Uh, is that that's is that you playing? That's me. Okay, so let's talk about harmonica a little bit because it's a very deceptive instrument. I mean, when I first started learning guitar, you know, Bob Dylan with the thing, yeah. I was like, I'll do I that. I have one of those. Yeah. And it's like, oh, this is easy. This is easy. And then you record yourself and you go, oh, okay. It's no, not easy. It's not easy yeah. at all. Front men that I like, a lot of them have played harmonica over the years. And I kept thinking, I've got to learn how to play harmonica. Yeah. I've got to learn how to play <laughs> harmonica. And uh, I can sing. I can phrase. I know how to do things musically. Uh, I'm not the greatest guitar player, but I can make up parts and songs, and I can yeah. come up with riffs and ideas. I thought I got to do this because I got to be able to do it myself. So I've been playing for about a year and a half, but I've yeah. done. If I do say so myself, I've done really well in a short amount of time. And that's why on here that I play actually two or three leads. Yeah, my favorite. Uh, What's it say? The future Colin. Don't expect me to play the harmonica solo this good live, okay? Yeah. <laughs> that harmonica solo on that yeah. song. Uh, Nick had the, the brilliant idea that he goes, Hey, why don't you, uh, you're playing the, uh, the C harmonica when the song, why don't you modulate the, the second part of the the harmonica solo and go to the F harmonica. So I'm carrying two harmonicas live here. Yeah. And in the studio I did too. And then that song uh, is a million miles an hour. And that phrasing on that harmonica, there's no breaths. And it's really fast for me. And I go, then I hop up to the other one right here. And then I hop right back. Yeah. And uh, that's why I keep telling people, if you see me live, don't expect it to be that <laughs> as good as it is in there. Tell me about the last song on side two. Just between you and me. We had played it as a band yeah. in that style. And it was just, eh, it was okay. Yeah. And uh, it just wasn't making it for me. So it got just kind of shoved to the side. Uh, and then when the record came about, I thought, this record needs, like I put on there, a kind of an, a miserable acoustic guitar song, you know, a miserable ballad type yeah. song. And then I, so I picked up the guitar at night, one night, and just started screwing around with it and kind of re, put a little middle part in there, played it with harmonica. You know, that sounds, that sounds pretty good, I think. And then I called Earl and I go, hey, can I come out and just, yeah. I go, it's just going to be me, acoustic guitar and that thing, you know, live, you know, a mic here and a mic here. And he said, yeah, come out. So I went out there 11 or 12 at night on a weekend and just cut the song, tried it twice, and the first one is the one we chose. And it just worked that way, that yeah. it didn't need anything else. I, I loved it, I oh, loved it. Thanks. it. To me, it's a real window of, of who you are and your sensibilities, and it's very, I mean, I, I'm always, I always like strip down things, mm-hmm. uh, you know, real, not necessarily heartache, but like true, true emotion. Yeah. And I can tell it's coming from, I mean, all these songs, but really yeah. that one, other than, you know, it sounds the most different, but it really jumped out at me. No love, no glory, no pretty stories, no happy endings to see. 
and I realized I wasn't going to be the kind of guy that would write baby, baby, baby songs, which I like some of those. But I, I thought I got to write from me, and I got to be able to sing the words. So I think a word's got to be something I can believe in, or feel, yeah. or think, or find true. <laughs> What are some of your more memorable uh, gigs, nights? Oh. oh my God! It could be, it could be like the one you had yesterday. Yeah, I mean, you know, you go through and there's all kinds of stuff that happens. And we played a trillion shows. Well, not a trillion, but a lot of shows. Uh, thousands. Thousands, though. Yes. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? That's yeah. just crazy to even think about. But there's so many uh, good ones and bad ones and strange ones. I remember we drove once in the freezing winter in a van that the heater was not working very good in. It was okay, but just okay, you know. So we're driving. We drove nine hours to Washington, D.C. Yeah. And we got there just in time to literally pull up at the door. We open up. We go in the doors. We start carrying it. And this place is gigantic with a ceiling, like a auditorium ceiling. And... There's nobody there. We're the last band. I mean, and there's, but I say nobody. There's 20, 15 people, 20 people in this gigantic cavernous place. And we think, oh, God. We we got to go straight on the stage. I mean, we don't have time to yeah. uh, change a clean shirt or you just barely had time to use the bathroom and get on stage and put your set list out. And we looked down there, there were eight people <laughs> to see us. Eight Aww. people. So... You know what, though? When we came up there and we were like, oh, God, this is horrible. You know, what a yeah. drag all this way for eight people and probably $50 if we're lucky for nine hours of drive. But, you know, you just you get on there and you do it. So I'm doing it and I'm writing the set list and there was people, these eight people were right at the front of the stage. And I remember that I couldn't tell you who this was. This girl goes, yeah, do that one and then do this one. She was writing so. <laughs> She goes, I want you to do this one. And, and people were joking with us and talking. Yeah. We're here to see you. And, you know, it was a fantastic show for those eight people. I mean, yeah. so much fun. I, like, I've still, all right now, I got goosebumps. I still remember it was just so fun and so great. Because, you know, the people loved us and it was so yeah. great. And I've, all, I've never forgot that show. And there are a million more. But that, that's just one that always sticks in my mind. In the sea. Have you ever had that moment where someone, or you look back at an old flyer or someone, hey, you remember that band we played with? They're so-and-so. Has that ever happened? Where you, you mean where they've gotten popular? Yeah. Yeah, of course, of course. We played with uh, Nirvana at Raji's. No. What? <laughs> you know, and uh, what year was that? Oh God, I don't know. It was right. It was when they were first coming out on okay. Sub Pop, and uh, so maybe like ninety. I don't 89. know what that year was. You know, there's so many shows. <laughs> I know, it's hard That's, to keep them all straight. Yeah. But I mean, they were just who opened for who? They were just a little more popular than we were okay. at the time. So they may have closed the show. Sure. Uh, we played with the Flaming Lips to nobody. Wow. Here in town. You know, I think at Raji's maybe also. And then they got a little, they got popular, yeah. you know, within. But they were not very popular for years, and they just finally happened with people. I don't know. There's probably more. I just can't think of any right, right now. Right. I, I mean, we, when we played, the Super Suckers opened up for us. Oh, nice. A couple nice. times. But, yeah. you know, now they're much more popular than we are. We were lucky enough along the years we played with Johnny Thunders. And we played with the Ramones. Wow. played with the Dictators. That's cool. Kind of the Forrest Gump through through the L.A. music scene here. Yeah, you can't help but, you know, <laughs> you've played with all kinds of people. Yeah. And, uh, here you come again. You say that you're my friend. But I know why you're here. I know you have a vinyl collection. I know you also collect books and movies. I but, do. But we are a vinyl. This is a vinyl channel. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I wonder if maybe, you, have you counted? Do you know how many records you have, maybe? Well, I would be a disappointment because... Uh, <laughs> You're not disappointed. I work in the in the industry, yeah. you know, unquote. 
and special effects do. And we we faced many layoffs over the years. Yeah. So I would, since I'm poor, I would literally have to sell. Right. I sold a lot of records okay. that I didn't want to sell. Yeah. But I sold them. So now I've probably only got in albums, three, four hundred albums. Yeah. But I mean, I used to have thousands. Oh. I yeah. don't even know how many I had. And I have a bunch of CDs. Yeah. And I have a bunch of singles. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have a million books. I, you know, I uh, really like having the uh, the records and the yeah. CDs and the books and the movies. And it's not because of, uh, just because I'm older. It's, I like, if you do something and I love it or I like it, I want to have it and I want to support it. Sure. That's me. Yeah. And I want to buy it. That's what you do. You you know, if somebody mm-hmm. gives you something, you give back to it. Yeah. I think that's fantastic. I mean, you, you put so much out there and then you support others. That's huge. If you love it, there's no reason not to support it. Yeah. Because if it, you want people to support you in whatever you do, right? I think it's what goes around comes around. Absolutely. I don't know. I just, I just think when you do that, you're having a... You're living. You're giving... You have a bigger life. You're doing something. You're out in the world. Yeah. Well, I, I'm excited for this next record that's coming out. I encourage you all to check out The Past Came Calling. It's out now. And uh, be sure to check out the rest of your discography. Um, thank you again. No, not at all. For, uh, I had a good time. So great. It was really fun. So I want to thank everybody for watching. Be sure to check out the album when you can. Until then, I'm your Vinyl Geek, and I'll catch you on the flip side. <laughs>